I want to start with a story from youth. Who attended a youth group growing up? Where in my youth group? Yeah. Who created some drama at the youth group? Yeah, hopefully good drama. Yeah, yeah, a few high hands on the sound desk. Apparently that's where the drama people go. We give them, we give them control of the microphones. Um, I remember one night at youth, we were just in the midst of doing what you do at youth, um, what you always do at youth, which is throw stuff at each other. Um, did anyone have that experience at youth? Like, there's always this group of kids who are just throwing stuff at each other. Like, be praise and worship, and they're just kids throwing stuff at each other, and the messy kids throwing stuff. Anyway, this was before, you know, the night had started. Well, it was actually at the end of the night, and there's a big group of us. We're standing at either end of the church auditorium in our old building, and we're just throwing stuff at each other because that's what feels good. It's just, there's nothing more satisfying than just like a headshot from across the room, right? You would never admit that, but you know it feels good, right? Unless you hit like, you know, someone's mum or something, that feels bad. But you know, when you just hit your friend and it's just right in the, anyway, and uh, the Call of Duty ping noise happens, that no, it's nothing more satisfying. Anyway, we're throwing stuff at each other, and I find in my hands the, the king of throwing implements. I found a vortex. We've got a picture just for reference. If you don't know, who knows what a vortex is? Who knows the OG skin vortex as well? None of these fancy colors. We want the blue and the yellow. Uh, who's, who's thrown a vortex before? It's satisfying, right? Has anyone been disappointed they couldn't throw up fast enough to whistle? Um, that's been me a time. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. That tri- like a trick is you throw it up in the air, and then usually when it comes back down, it goes fast enough. Anyway, I had a vortex, and I saw someone across the room, and I'm like, here we go. This is my moment. Wound it up, you know, got the running thing, throw so hard that, threw so hard that my arm like almost popped out of its socket. And it was like at this moment that, slow motion just engaged. You know when something epic happens and it's like life just goes slow motion and this vortex is just soaring across the sky through the youth group. And at, at that time, I'm sure that people had turned and were watching and had the draw, jaws were dropping and it's coming and it, it's just about to hit my friend in the head when they just kind of matrix, they move back to lean backwards and this voice is like grazes their face and just <laughs> flies past and, and in a moment I'm like no and then my no was kind of amplified when I realized that kind of behind this person on the wall was one of these things if one there's one of those <laughs> on the wall now they're quite small right they're quite small. So usually that's not it. like there's a hand there. I've put the hand there for scale. Like, can we go back to the vortex? The vortex is a lot bigger than a finger, right? So I think we're good. And so we have the, the fire alarm, but slow motion, the vortex, the most terrible and beautiful throw of my whole life impacts where that man's finger is, breaks the glass and sets the fire alarm off. And all of a sudden, just all heck breaks loose. Kids are running, kids are screaming. It's like, doop, doop, doop. I, this is, I, I couldn't find a picture to describe this moment, so I asked AI to make a picture. It's, it didn't quite look like that. There wasn't like, the, the kind of looks like Tony Abbott in the middle there, he wasn't there. Uh, but just, it just bedlam broke out. It just, this insanity broke out. We had to evacuate the whole building and all the kids are at the front and I'm standing there and I'm responsible. The best and the worst moment of my life. It was, it was so close to being just a beautiful headshot, but yeah, so far. Turn the person beside you say, so close, yet so far. Now that's a dumb story, but I'm sure we've, we've all got a so close yet so far story, right? Maybe it, was, uh, maybe it was the grand final of kids soccer at school and you shot what was going to be the winning goal and it bounced off the post. Or maybe you got 49% 
on an exam, which is a fail, but I'd argue that 51% is just as much a fail. Um, can you imagine if you went to the doctors and it was like, yeah, I got, I got 60% on my test. You'd be like, I don't want to see this doctor. I think that's still a fail. Maybe you were like reaching for something high up and you just weren't tall enough. Have you had that experience where, where you're like, yeah, a few people are like, always, that happens all the time. Some places just aren't designed for people under six foot for some reason. It's like, I, I'm not going to be able to reach that. Maybe it's just missing an elevator. You know, when you're kind of running and you make eye contact with the person. And if it's me, I'm pushing like the close button as fast as I can. Like, no, 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 close, close, close. You know, maybe it's going to the shop and the thing you wanted, they're like, oh, we just sold the last one. Don't you hate it when they tell you that? It's like, don't tell me that. Just say we don't have any. Don't tell me that I just missed out. So close yet so far. You know, interesting, we kind of see this concept play out all through the Bible, where people come so close to greatness, so close to destiny, so close to purpose, so close to achieving something great for God, but for whatever reason, they they just kind of miss out on what God's trying to do through them. Something stops them. I think of like the rich young ruler, if you know his story, he comes to Jesus and he talks to Jesus. He says, what, what else must I do? And he's, Jesus says, you've got to follow the commands. You've got to do all these things. And the, the guy's like, I, I've done that. I can do that. And Jesus is like, you know, one thing you need to do, you need to give away what you have to bless other people. And it's like, the guy's like, he just can't do it. It's, it, it makes me wonder, I wonder what would have happened if he had decided, I'm going to give it up. Maybe he would have written some of the Bible. Maybe he would have become a disciple. He was so close, but so far. I, I think of the Pharisees. They knew the Scripture. They were in places of influence within the society, but, but they couldn't get past their own pride and their own zealousness. They were so close. They were positioned to be able to make a change, but so far, they, they missed what God was trying to do. And I think there's a story that highlights this so well in Acts. And the reason I, I want to speak about this this evening is I'm convinced that God wants to do something good through my life. I'm convinced that God wants to do something good through your life. I believe that God has got a great future for you. He wants to use you to change the world around you. But when I think of that for myself, sometimes I worry, man, I hope I won't come so close yet so far and maybe miss what God is trying to do through me. Acts 24, 22 to 27. It's actually 21 to 27. No, it's 22 to 27. Then Felix, who was acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. I should give some context here. Paul has kind of been preaching. All of the Jewish people get upset with him. They arrest him. He gets sent for a trial. The, the guy who's trying him kind of doesn't know what to do. So they send him on to this other guy called Felix to kind of make a judgment on this case. All the religious leaders are making these false accusations about Paul. And it gets sent to this guy called Felix, who's in power. He's like a governor of the region. And it says, um, verse 23, basically, Paul gets kept under guard but they give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his, la- his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a bold move by Paul right here, right? He's about to get tried for all of these things. He's about to be judged. He's about to be sentenced. This guy is proceeding over the case. And he's like, let me tell you the good news about Jesus. And then it says, as Paul talked about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and he said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Now talk about hidden motives. He's like, come tell me about your Jesus again. And then he's like, so when are you going to like offer me some money? And it says, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus because Felix wanted to grant favor to the Jews. He left Paul in prison. Now, as I was reading this story, you know, sometimes in the Bible, you know how you can see yourself in kind of one of the people? Have you ever had that? So, and I often have the problem of having like main character moments. Has anyone had like a main character moment? The other day I was sitting in the, at the, at the, the, the train kind of line in my car and this song came on it was just big main character moment I'm sitting there I'm like I'm the coolest guy in the world and no one's looking at me but I'm like I'm living my best life 
Sometimes it can be really easy to relate with like the Paul, right? And be like, yeah, man, if I was in prison, I'd be preaching about Jesus. And, but as I was reading this, I kind of resonated a little bit with Felix. Again, I, I know that God is trying to do something great through my life, but I can kind of see some barriers that Felix faced when presented with the gospel that I face as well. As I read this, I thought, imagine if in that moment, imagine, imagine if instead of being afraid and imagine if Felix had opened his heart to what Paul was trying to share with him, how different a story we might be reading. And I just want to look at a couple of these barriers, barriers maybe to experiencing all that God wants to do through us. Who wants to do something big for God? Who wants to live a great big life? Well, some barriers that I think some of us, all of us face. The first one we see, I think, is convenience or inconvenience. It's interesting how Felix says, he kind of gets afraid and then he's like, leave me until a more convenient time. So Paul's there presenting him with the good news. He's talking about righteousness. He's talking about self-control. He's talking about all of these things. God trying to work through Paul and Felix's life. But Felix, Felix's response is, ah, we'll, we'll put this off till a better time, till it's more convenient. And I swear when I read this, I was a bit like, ah, oh. you know, there's been times where maybe I've put off what God's been trying to do because maybe it wasn't so convenient. Sometimes I can think, my timing might be a little bit better. Sometimes I think, God, if, if you could just, just not now, God, like just maybe next week or when I get through this stuff, that would be when I'm less busy, then that would be a better time for, for you to use me. Who's ever noticed that good things never usually happen out of convenience? Like I think about going to the gym. No one ever says, yeah, I just started going to the gym because it was like so convenient. Like, I don't even know what happened. I just, I'm there and I started working out and now I'm really fit. It was, it was just so convenient, you know. No one ever says that. Everyone who's ever been committed to attending the gym is like, I've got to actually push through the inconvenience because I know the result is going to be worth it. You know, how inconvenient is it to eat healthily? Like, let's be honest. Have you ever been like, maybe you're in a fix, you didn't bring lunch or whatever, and you're like, I've got to get some food out, but I don't want to eat something that makes me feel awful. I don't want to eat KFC and then regret it for the rest of the week. It, it, who knows? It can be inconvenient to actually try to be healthy. In the same way, if we want to see God do something big in our life, we've actually got to be willing to be inconvenienced, if that makes sense. We, we've got to be careful that we don't get our way and our desires and, and how I want my to look, my way, how I want my life to look. We've got to be careful we don't let that get in the way of what God is trying to do through us. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than than your thoughts. If we want to experience all that God has for us, we have to embrace God's timing and understand that it might look a little bit different to our timing. You know, I was really encouraged. We were at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago. And at the conference, I just, I got this sense of like, I started thinking about the university. I started thinking about like, you know, we got, is it UniSQ now? It's changed names recently. And I started thinking like, oh man, like we've got this big group of young people. What are we doing to like reach out to them? Like we've got some really good news to share about hope and about joy. And we've got all this good news. What are we doing? And I started getting this kind of conviction. Now nah, we need to do something out there. Fast forward to the weekend and um, Josh messages me and he's like, hey, are we still thinking about doing stuff at the uni just out of the blue? And I was like, yes. And he's like, I'm in, I'll do it. And I was like, awesome. Let, let's get together and, and let's chat about it. And Josh isn't going to like me telling the story, embarrassing him. Um, but I think it really, it really presents this well. We're, and we, we got together and we're talking about what it could look like and, and we're talking about like, you know, one night a week, let's get in there and do something. And Josh is like, oh, is it at nighttime? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, He's like, I was just prepared to like full send it with work and, and kind of work it out. He's like, I thought it was like a daytime kind of thing. And I was like, 
how awesome is that? I'm like, you were prepared <laughs> to give up a day of work just so you could be a part of what God wants to do in the university. And I think that's the attitude we got to take where actually, God, I want to seek your way first. Your way is my priority. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you to sort everything out. Can we give it up for Josh? Because I think that really, he'll hate that. But I just think this, and it made me laugh too. I'm like, bro, you were like, you were just going to full send it. He's like, yeah, I was just going to full send it until work. I can't come in on Wednesdays anymore. And I'm like, you got a full-time job, man. Uh, I'm not saying that you necessarily should do that. But man, come on, if God's doing something in your heart, you've got to be prepared to pursue what God is doing. It might not, be, it might not seem convenient, but we've got to trust God's timing. Seek first. I really think that it's, it's a priority thing. The, the Bible says, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. It's a priority thing. Where, where is seeking God? Where is chasing after what God wants to do th- through you? Where is that on your priority list? So we've got to overcome convenience. The second thing I see is that I think we all face is, is self-centeredness. Can, can I be the first to admit that it can be a challenge sometimes to think beyond myself and what I think is good for me. I think it's so interesting and funny that, that Felix keeps him around. He keeps Paul around hoping to get a bribe. He's like, I'll, I'll keep Paul around because maybe he'll pay me some money. And it's, it's almost ironic that he keeps him around for a little bit of money when God, what God was trying to do through Paul was so much greater can you imagine the freedom that, that you know, the knowing the freedom that comes through Jesus, the joy that comes through Jesus, the hope that comes through Jesus. It's so close to Felix, but he can't get past, maybe I can get some money. I mean, how much more valuable is what God was trying to do than some dollars that maybe Paul could have paid him to get out of prison? He was so focused on what he could get out of him that he missed what God was trying to do in and through him. What God was trying to do was so much better than what he was trying to get out. You know, as I was kind of thinking through this, I again felt a little bit convicted. At, I feel like at sometimes I've maybe treated God a little bit, or treated prayer, and my prayers have maybe looked a little bit more like a wish list than maybe a vision statement. You know, and, and I think it's so good that we invite God into our life and we pray about things that are important to me. I think that it's, it creates intimacy when we ask God to be involved in our life. I think that's so good. But I remember feeling a little bit convicted. How much am I praying about the things I want God to do for me? And how much am I praying about the things I want God to do through me? How much am I praying about, come on, God, would you use me in my workplace? God, would you use me in my family? God, would you make a way for us to share good news about you? in the university or, or wherever it is. How much am I praying about that? And, and how much am I praying? God, I pray for a good day today. And I pray that I'd have good dreams tonight. That's, that's my go-to bread time prayer because who knows good dreams are a good thing. I think God wants us to have good dreams. But I, I remember feeling a little bit convicted that oh, even in my prayer, am I, am I too self-centered? And I think our relationship with God, if we want to do something big for God, it has to move beyond just what can God do for me. And it has to move to God, what can you do through me? What are you trying to do through me in the world around me? If we, if we aren't careful, self-centeredness can become a barrier to what God's trying to do through our lives. Self-centeredness. And the last one I see is, is fear. It obviously says there, it says, that as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, it says Felix was afraid. Now this is so interesting given Felix's history and and who Felix is. Felix is actually, there's a lot to read about him that's even outside of the Bible. He's a historical figure that you can research and read about. And every bit of study about Felix that you read concludes that he was a harsh guy, he was an unfair guy, and what he's known for is extorting people like he was trying to do to Paul, and he was known for executing people without due process. Now that kind of puts this whole thing in perspective a bit. This is the guy that Paul is standing in front of preaching to, and this guy is a bad guy. This guy has done some bad things. This guy is known for killing people without any process. But yet, he, he's afraid. When, when Paul starts to talk about righteousness and self-control, 
and judgment. Now, we don't know exactly what Paul says there because it doesn't have like a list of his sermon. But what we can do is look at what Paul talks about when he talks about righteousness. And what we'll discover is that when Paul talks about righteousness, his big thing is that we're right with God, not because of what we do, but because of who Jesus is and because he stepped in the gap. So as he's, he's talking about righteousness to Felix, and then he's talking about self-control, which is that God can empower us to live free and live full in the total experience of what he has for us. And as he speaks about judgment, that, you know, how we live today actually has implication on our tomorrow and on our future. And and as he talks about these things to a guy who has not shown self-control, who's probably not living in a way that would be considered righteous, instead of hearing that as good news, because that's good news to Felix. It's good news that your righteousness is not based on your acts because he's got a lot of bad acts. And it's good news that self-control can actually help you, that that God wants to empower you through self-control to live the kind of life because He's not living in that way. But for whatever reason, that just shuts Felix down. He becomes afraid. You know, we don't know exactly what his response of fear is based on. It could have been how much it would cost him to make a decision to follow Jesus. It would cost his position, cost his power. Who knows what it would have cost him? I wonder if it might have even been fear of what might have been confronted within him, knowing his history, knowing his past, that if I open my heart, maybe he was afraid of what would have to be confronted within himself. Again, I think for all of us, if we wanna do something great for God, we're gonna be confronted by some of these things. There's going to be times where maybe we're confronted by the fear of what's going to happen if I follow Jesus. What will people think of me? What will people say? How, how will people view me if, if, if I'm maybe a bit more open about my faith? We're going to have to overcome the fear of maybe God confronting some stuff within us. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I can feel a bit like, yeah, God, you can do whatever in my life. Just don't touch that one thing. <laughs> it's like, I'm not ready for that. Maybe it might be just you, all this other stuff is great, but that box, just we're going to leave that. We just seal that one up a few times. We throw it in the back. We're going to take it to the airport. We're going to stick it on that weird cellophane kind of luggage wrapper machine. And we're going to like put that right out the back because I'm afraid that I don't know what's going to happen, God, if I let you into that space. But if we want to do something great for God, we actually got to allow Him into every area of our life. Interestingly, I think Paul is the complete opposite of Felix. Interestingly, Paul is very similar to Felix. He's known at the start of Acts, we've read his story for persecuting and killing Christians. He's done some bad stuff. Paul could have been described in the same way that Felix was described, but he said yes to the call of Jesus and now he's living this impacting life. Paul's actually the one who had every reason to be afraid. He's standing in front of this dude that he should have been afraid of. But he didn't let that be a barrier to pursuing what God had called him to do. And then he would go on to write about fear in Philippians. He'd say, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. You know, when Paul writes stuff like that, it's like, geez, he's got the experience to back it up. It's like... When I think about the things that make me anxious, it's like I was driving around in my car on zero Ks to go on the field today, and I was anxious about that. This is like Paul who's standing in front of a dude who could kill him, and he's preaching to him, and then later on he's like, hey, don't be be anxious. Trust that God's at work. Trust Trust that God can use you. Trust that God will bring you peace that goes beyond all understanding. In our journey of following God, there will be times where we have to confront fear. But I think in all of that, we've got to remember that God's heart for us is healing. God's heart for us is wholeness. God's heart for us is future. If there's a little box that you're afraid of letting God into, can I just encourage you? You can trust God. God is faithful. God is good. That is His heart. His heart's not to expose you and to wreck you and to break you. His heart is to heal you. His heart is to, to put the broken pieces back together. Our God is faithful. He has your best interest at heart. So I thought it'd be appropriate just to finish with maybe a few questions just as we maybe to apply this and and, and to ponder over what's been shared 
this evening. The first question, have you been shying away from anything out of fear? As we speak about fear, can you identify something in your life that maybe you've been shying away from because you're afraid of what that might look like? It might be fear of what you have to give up, fear of what might be confronted within you, fear of maybe not being good enough. Can I just encourage you? Come on, the God, the, God, the, the, the Bible says that the Spirit God has given us is not one of fear, that it's the spirit of boldness. Come on, you don't need to be afraid. You can trust God. He's got a good plan for your life. He's got a good future for you. He wants to heal you. Just look, and, and, and whatever you might feel, oh, man, I'm just, I just don't know. What will it look like? And, and what if it doesn't work out? Come on, you can trust God. He's faithful. He's good. So what have you been shying away from out of fear? Is it time to maybe re-engage that? Is, is it time to invite God into that space? That's what Paul says through anything, in, in prayer and petition, by, by going to God and, and talking to Him about it. That's where I find peace. What are you afraid of? Is there anything you've opted out of due to inconvenience? Just thinking about your life, thinking in the context of God wanted to do something great. Is there anything that you've opted out of because it wasn't convenient? Because you're too busy. And I'm afraid to say that because I know we're all so busy, right? We're all busy. One thing I've discovered about life, it seems to have a habit of getting busier. If you asked me when I was 17, fresh out of high school, if I was busy, I would have said, yeah, man, I'm so busy. I'm working 10 hours a week at the BP. It's hectic. <laughs> if you ask me when I started working full time, if I was busy, I would say, yeah, I'm so busy. I'm on call once a month. I have to work 10 days straight. If you ask me when I was overseas, are you busy? I would say, oh man, busiest I've ever been. I'm working three jobs. I'm leading a church. I'm busy. If you ask me now, I'd be like, I'm busy. I've got three kids. That really kind of stretches your capacity. Like, it's like, I really thought I was busy, but really I was not busy at all. I know we're busy. And, and ultimately, we've got to be wise. And I'm not saying burn yourself out just doing stuff for whatever reason. But what we do need to be is sensitive and submitted to God's timing. That if God's put something on our heart, we've got to be prepared to get inconvenienced by it and step out and say, God, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm just going to full send. I'm just going to tell work. I'm not going to show up on Wednesday because I've got places to be because I know that God is calling me to do something big. So yes, be wise. Yes, don't push yourself to the limit. But I think for a long time, maybe we've talked too much about just taking it chill and not enough about sometimes we actually got to work hard to see God do something through our life. But let's be working hard at the right stuff. Let's not be working hard at the stuff that doesn't matter, but let's work hard at chasing Jesus, at reaching our friends, at pursuing all that He's called us to do. So, so my challenge to you would be, before you say, I'm too busy, before that's your response, my question would be, have you prayed about it? If you pray about it and you're like, it is just not wise for me to take it on at this moment, come on, go for it. But, but at least have heard that from God. Because if God's calling you to it, He'll make it clear to you that He's calling you to it. I hope hear my words with grace, please. I'm not trying to call anyone out. I know in my life, there's times where I've opted out just because it doesn't seem convenient because I'm, I'm too busy. But I've keep coming back to this place of, man, I just know that God wants to do something big through my life. And that means that I'm going to have to say, say no to the right things and yes to the right things at times. Final question. Are you so absorbed in your own desires from God that you might actually be neglecting His actual intentions? Just, have you been... Maybe even this is a good time to think about your prayer life. Is most of your prayer about yourself or are you praying bigger than that? And if most of your prayer is about yourself, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying there will come a time where it's time to look outside of yourself and not just to look, look at what God's doing in you, but start to look at what God's trying to do through you. What God's doing in you might be a clear indicator of what He's trying to do through you. 
Are you treating God as a genie in a lamp or as a king who wants the best for you? Someone who ultimately has rule and reign over your life and you can trust Him because He does have what's best for you. Are you missing what He's trying to do because you think you need Him to do something else? Can I be the first to admit that, man, there's been times where I've done this in my life. I'm praying so hard for something that I've actually missed the thing that God was trying to do through me. Let's determine, hey, that we're not going to be so close yet so far from what God wants to do through our lives. Let's not be, I feel like there's in this room, there's some people here, you're going to take this, you're going to run with it. There's other people, you're on the edge. You're like, I'm not, I'm not sure. Come on, don't be so close yet so far. Look back on tonight and be like, I made a decision that I was going to pursue Jesus with all of my heart because I'm convinced and sold out to what He wants to do through me. Would we stand? I'd love to pray for us as we finish. I'd really love to pray this evening. Maybe you're here and something I've spoke about, spoke in your heart. And I'm starting to feel, I hope, I hope you're hearing this from the right place. This is, I care about you. This is not, this is, this is I struggle with this stuff too. So I'll be the first one on this altar call. <laughs> but maybe there's been something and it's just like, yeah, God's really putting something on your heart. Maybe there's like a vision that's starting to come to life a little bit. Maybe, maybe you've even just got a place in your heart or, or a person in your heart. It's like God's kind of putting a highlight or an, an underline over that which I think is just God trying to do something. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you. Would we just close our eyes? And maybe that's, if that's you in your own way, just make this your prayer also. Jesus, we thank you for all that you want to do through us. We thank you that even though you're all powerful and almighty, you choose to work through us. Broken vessels, imperfect people, but people who have chosen to pursue you. God, I pray that you'd fill us with vision afresh. You'd fill us with dreams afresh. God, I pray that the excuses might would start to fade away, God, that, that we'd get our priorities straight, God. We pray that as you speak to us and, and you highlight in our lives the things that you want to do in our life, God, I pray that those that we'd be able to see past those barriers, that we wouldn't be so caught up with what we think the best plan is for our life, that we miss your plan for our life. God, we pray that we wouldn't be so caught up in our busyness, that we, we miss the things that actually really matter. And God, we pray, we pray that we wouldn't be, I guess, so caught up with, with fear and worry about what we don't know that we miss it. God, we're so determined to pursue you and all that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen.